ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schripp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So today in my life, um, it's actually Saturday for me right now. It's why the podcast is coming out late to you. We, we had uh, storms hit us last night and I lost internet, so I couldn't, I mean, I could record, but I didn't have my notes, I didn't have anything to, to go off of and figured I'll just do it in the morning. By the way, I think like three of the worst storms I've ever seen in my life have been since we moved into this place. So I, I don't know if it's just an area, you know, like stuff just happens here that doesn't really happen in, you know, Madison or Milwaukee or Chicago or other places I've lived, Whitewater. And this is kind of a whitewatery town. So I, I don't know, man. I don't know. But last night it was hail. And I know I've heard people talk about like golf ball sized hail. And I'm like, that's not real. I've never seen. And it wasn't quite golf ball, but it was big, dude. Trying to think what size, um, maybe like super ball sized, you know, like a generic. I don't know. That doesn't, they're all different sizes, but I think you know what I mean. Big. Got dents all over the car. It was great. Knocked out the internet. Nightmare. But um, for some reason, I actually slept in until 730 in the morning. And I don't think I've done that in a long time. I may have done that while we were on vacation, but we were up until probably midnight-ish. I was out at 8.30 last night, so I got like 11 hours, so I don't know how to feel. Um, But anyways, today we are picking up the pup, so that's kind of cool. And I think you're all caught up in uh, my life and times and whatnot. Before we get too much into it, I do have a big announcement to make, and um, I don't think I did a very good job of, of... promoting this, at least not on the podcast. I think social media did fine. And at the end of the day, I think we got a good amount of followers on Instagram. So hopefully uh, Jacob is satisfied with <laughs> with the efforts. But we do have a winner. We have a winner for the Alan Lazard signed football giveaway. And as promised, it will be in fact announced today as in right now. I should be smart and be like after the break, but let's just do it because I'm going to forget and I'm going to feel bad if I forget. The winner of the signed Alan Lazard football is Mr. Captain Colby Jack, i.e. Jack, a.k.a. Johnny P. Montano Jr. I think, haven't you won something in the past? Didn't you win something like last time or something? I just remember saying your name before. I mean, I I talked to you within four hours ago on Instagram. (laughs) <laughs> My most recent message on Instagram was was Johnny, so that's kind of funny. Maybe that's how I know your name. I don't know. It's a great name, though. Congratulations on the football. Um, reach out once again on Instagram, and uh, Jacob will coordinate that with you and get that out to you. Thank you very much to everybody that uh, got involved and helped prom- promote the podcast. Thank you very much to Jacob for doing all this stuff. He does a lot of work. Um, and all these items that are being given away, it's his personal stuff. He buys it for himself and then gives it away. He's also been working uh, with me on some other things, um, never accepts anything I offer him, so I gotta at least shout out Bearded Buck. Did you get a new website, dude? I think it used to be beardedbuck.co or something, but that link is broken and I found a different one, beardedbuckco.com, beardedbuckco as in company.com. But if you got a beard and you're trying to do some stuff, um, none of that goes to me, it's not a promotion or anything like that, I mean, it's just, I'm just trying to help the guy out. But anytime I need any kind of beard-related stuff, which I haven't actually used in a while, I just let this thing do whatever it's doing. I got to get on the ball. I got to find my stuff. I, everything is lost. since I, I haven't even been able to trim my beard because I don't know if my beard trimmer is getting a little crazy. But it'd be cool if you could support a, uh, another listener of the podcast, a local guy, beardedbuckco.com. Okie dokie schmokey. Didn't have training camp yesterday. Didn't have a lot of other stuff. We did have Matt LaFleur uh, do a press conference. So I want to get through a couple of those comments. Oh my goodness, the yawning is out of control. I feel so dumb when I sleep in and I'm tired. That's the worst part about sleeping in. It's like, there you go, I did something for you to feel better now. And it's like, no. Well, then I'm never sleeping in again. If I'm just going to be tired anyways, I might as well get six hours like I normally do. The heck is the point? That's weird. Like, I, that didn't used to be a thing. I, I remember waking up and just... You know, your eyes just kind of wake up, and you're like, ah, I feel refreshed. I have not had that in years. I think something's wrong with I'm broken, dude. Either that or it just happens when you hit 30. I don't know. Doctors, reach out to me. Let me know if I'm broken. The Fleur calls running back Patrick Taylor one of the most intelligent players he's been around. That one comment 
bumped him up in my running back rankings. That is, that's not coach speak, right? I talk all the time about trying to read between the lines and stuff, and there's a whole lot of of nonsense things that he says. I shouldn't say nonsense, but it's basically nothing comments. You know, people ask a question, he doesn't really want to answer it. So he says something and it's like, yeah, that doesn't really mean anything. This is not one of those things at all. One of the most intelligent players he's been around, especially when I've been saying for a very long time, assuming I'm correct, that the biggest reason that young guys or whatever, and I know Taylor's been around, but the biggest reason that these guys don't get on the field is because they don't know what to do. We've heard the young guys talk about, you know, Sternberger, I think it was, talk about the hardest thing is understanding the formations. Was it Sternberger? That doesn't make sense. I thought it was like a rookie. It was Amari, I think. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Who cares? Move on, genius. Did I tell you I'm going cold instant coffee today? I haven't done that in a long time either. It's it's good, man. It's uh, nostalgic. Early morning? Well, it's not early morning, but it feels early. Coach uh, Matt LaFleur says there's, quote, great competition, unquote, to be his third running back between Kylan Hill, Patrick Taylor, and Dexter Williams. A.J. Dillon will get some snaps in preseason, but those three will get, quote, bulk of the carries, unquote, as the competition plays out. First of all, although we already knew it, it does feel great because it didn't have to go this way. It does feel real good that it's already just assumed that A.J. Dillon is the man, right? He's already basically not getting any snaps because they want to protect him because he's the guy. I I want to appreciate that for a moment because let's remember how common it is to miss on picks. It is not a foregone conclusion that a second-round draft pick has to be a really good starter. And I, I shouldn't necessarily say really good, but, I mean, if the guy can't play, they're not going to put him in that spot, right? We don't know what Eric Stokes is going to be. We don't necessarily know what Josh Myers is going to be, even though there's been some good reports. He might not be very good. We don't know what Amari Rogers is going to be, even though there's been fairly good reports coming out from him as well. Not everybody has to be a hit. Sometimes you swing and just wildly miss, and the Packers have done that many times, like every team has. So I just wanted to pause there and appreciate that, that we're just we're just moving on and, and assuming. And, and again, I, I don't want to say the guy's name, and I, I don't exactly know what it is anyways, but there's a YouTuber who for some reason has decided to go full-on anti-Packers, I think because it just makes people a lot of money. They know that the most lucrative thing you can do if you want to get a lot of attention and retweets and stuff is to attack the pack. I have to assume that because it's just what everybody decides to do after they've been in this thing for a while. Which is odd to me, because I don't really think that that's even true. I mean, have you tried Cowboys fans? There's a lot of them. Um, Eagles fans are crazy. I mean, just just from having a YouTube channel and, and, you know, Steelers fans lost their minds when I said their wide receivers weren't good. Maybe they're just not as active on Twitter. I don't know. It depends on the platform. Maybe it's because they're polite. Packer fans are just polite on YouTube. So they get a ton of retweets uh, over at Twitter, and then nobody cares. Any- I don't know. I have no idea. But he made some kind of a comment, and I don't remember, I think it was after the Josh Myers pick, and he said, another wasted second-round pick for the Packers. I can't remember the last time the Packers wasted a second-round pick. It was it Josh Jackson? No offense, Josh, and he had a great day uh, the other day. But I, the, if there's any round the Packers do really well in, it's the second round. You can kind of come at the Packers from just about any round, and I'll probably fight you on it. I mean, you know, back in the Ted days, you could say first round, and I'd be like, yeah, we kind of suck at that. But I think we've done fairly well since Ted. Ted really didn't miss, you know, second, third, fourth round. That was that was his money round, and then the undrafted free agents were untouchable. First round was no good, and then the later rounds were generally not very good anyways. But assuming Rashawn comes around, that was a good pick. You know, I had somebody kind of bust me out for... Let me, let me just pause here for a minute, because um, I talk once in a while about Mr. Negative... And again, uh, him and I argue all the time, but I really do appreciate him being so negative, uh, whether he's joking around or being serious or whatever, because it just forces me to really look into stuff. And sometimes I just really notice things. And he was kind of coming down on Rashawn and um, to some degree just asking questions, but um, more or less saying that it was just a terrible pick. And so he says, well, who else was available at that time? Well, the first thing he says, is, would you rather have him or burn straight up? And I said, you could probably make a pretty good case for Burns, but I don't know. I'd have to look into it. But the first thing is I, I, I did is I looked at the other picks in that round after Rashawn. I slept in and I got coffee, man. This is going to be a ranty one. You, you just got to buckle up, all right? If you think I'm going to stay on topic, maybe maybe check in tomorrow. That's not how this works when when I get to sleep in and drink coffee, all right? So let's, let's look at Rashawn for a minute. So I, I kind of just um, grabbed a screenshot. So 
between Rashawn Gary and our next pick, Darnell Savage, which again, we kind of assume Darnell's a pretty good pick, but I don't know. We'll see. We're all happy with it. You've got Christian Wilkins, Chris Lindstrom, Dwayne Haskins, Brian Burns, Dexter Lawrence, uh, Garrett Bradbury. I don't know why I want to say Grady Jarrett. That's way off. Garrett Bradbury, Jeff Simmons, Noah Fant. That's our list. And um, we both were kind of looking at each other like, yeah, now what? Because I'm looking at it like that's not a great list. And he's like, dude, there's a ton of studs in there. And he says, well, isn't Christian Wilkins real solid? And I said, well, he's had four sacks in the last two years. According to your definition, that would probably be a bust, right? That's not great. We know Dwayne Haskins is no good. And then when I looked at Brian Burns, I said, Brian Burns had 10 sacks last year as a full-time, I believe, number one pass rusher. Rashawn Gary, as the number three guy with very limited snaps, had nine sacks. So um, I don't know, man. Jeffrey Simmons, likewise, five sacks over the last, I think, three years because he missed the entire first year. Had two sacks, and then this past year was three. Again, Rashawn, nine in his last one year and not even a full-time guy. And Noah Fant, the stats uh, and grades are just really not there. I think it's kind of a foregone conclusion. And it's it's another thing, Broncos fans are weird. Like I've never really noticed Broncos fans. And I feel like they've always just been kind of humble and whatever. And they feel like they've got the greatest team in history. And they don't really have anybody that's done anything. I mean, Noah has potential, but he hasn't done anything. What did he have, like two touchdowns or something last year? Something stupid? He had three touchdowns. I mean, he graded out fairly well, not as a blocker, obviously, because he's not even, he's, what, 245 or something? But he had somewhat of a breakout year if you just look at the grades, which was like a 70, which is, you know, I mean, uh, according to everybody else who says that Alan Lazard, who's graded out at like a consistent 75 as a bust, I don't think I can really give Noah Fant very much credit for a 70, but he had a better season than before when he was a 52. But he's had back-to-back, I mean, six touchdowns in two years. So again, if we just look at Rashawn Gary was a bust. It was a wasted pick. Okay, well, who should we have picked? You can maybe say Brian Burns, but again, you give Rashawn Gary the same amount of opportunities Brian Burns had. Rashawn Gary 1,000% would have had a better year than Brian Burns. We love to, um, we love to have real strong opinions, and then when the Packers don't do what we do, we assume that everybody else was great, and we got the one guy that's no good. Remember how much everybody loved Josh Allen and how he was supposed to be the first pass rusher that went? or excuse me, the second after Nick Bosa, but Cleveland Furl went, and it's like, I cannot believe Josh Allen is falling. The guy had two sacks last year. I mean, he didn't play a full year, so, I mean, whatever. But he also didn't have 10% pressure rate. 22 pressures on 246 attempts. It's not going well. Remember Ed Oliver, how much everybody was positive he was going to be elite? He's been a horrific defensive tackle. Terrible. Maybe he turns around, I don't know, but he's been real bad. Devin White, again, nobody agrees with me, but he's graded out terribly. He's a horrific run defender. He's done nothing but rush the passer kind of well. Horrific in coverage. I mean, he just gets lit up. Cleland Furl, again, two sacks last year. He did have a better than 10% pressure rate, but he had two sacks last year, five the year before, 30 pressures, which is nothing compared to Rashawn Gary. So outside of Nick Bosa, with Cleland Furl, uh, we can even go defensive tackles. Quinnen Williams, um... Let's see, Ed Oliver, uh, Christian Wilkins, Josh Allen, Brian Burns, Dexter Lawrence, Jeffrey Simmons, Montez Sweat. I think he's kind of picking up. I should check him out. Jerry Tillery, who was a guy that I kind of liked. I think he's been horrifically bad. LJ Collier, which is hilarious. The Seahawks are a joke. Um, That whole list there, with the exception maybe of Montez Sweat, who had a breakout year last year. But again, full year, 10 sacks. Same thing as as Rashawn. Give Rashawn the opportunities Montez has had. I still think Rashawn... I think you can make a case that of all the defensive tackles and edge rushers, anybody along the defensive line, Rashawn Gary might be the best. Again, outside of Nick Bosa. So it's hard to make the case that the Packers are bad at this, especially when, again, a lot of not good players... Oh, and then you come to Darnell Savage. Oh, he's pretty good. And the year before that was Jair. You after that was Jordan Love. We don't know what he is. You after that was Stokes. We don't know what he is. So again, some people... Yeah, I don't know. They, they love to uh, act like I'm a homer when it comes to the drafting stuff because they just hate the Packers who they draft. Um, and they love to be critical of the Packers after they draft. There was somebody, I think uh, JJ retweeted it or whatever, but um, somebody did something on Reddit that showed when the teams generally melt down. It had the Bears pre-draft are in meltdown mode. The Packers post-draft are in meltdown mode. Um, the Vikings like preseason or in meltdown mode, and then the Lions season is like a, a dumpster fire. 
And it's it's true, at least insofar as, uh, well, this year the Vikings are in complete collapse mode. But at post-draft, it's always the Packers. Because the Packers fans hate, hate, hate everybody that gets drafted. And sometimes they just can't let that go. And so we have to sit here and, and I have to sit here and try to defend the picks all the time because nobody wants to go back and revisit and go, actually, that guy panned out pretty well. And when you look at the entire um, landscape, it's a whole bunch of misses. And the Packers are one of the few that didn't miss. And again, nobody liked the second. Everybody hated the pick of, I shouldn't say hated Elton Jenkins, but he wasn't a very popular pick. It was a whole bunch of like, who's that again? Like, oh, okay, I guess. Now everybody's talking Pro Bowl. Everybody hated the A.J. Dillon pick, saying he was like a fourth-round running back that was stupid. Where are those people, by the way? Where are all the, uh, he's, he wasn't worth a second-round pick type of guys? By, by my account, again, he didn't play very much, but by my account, he was the, I believe, second-best running back in football last year in, in his limited opportunities, and, and we'll see how it pans out, but um, I'm just curious where all those people are. And again, we get Josh Myers, the Packers wasted another second-round pick. And all we've heard, Aaron Rodgers, is there anybody that stands out to you? It's Josh Myers. Everybody has just put out nothing but constant praise of Josh Myers. And so, I mean, again, you'll have Mr. Negative, and I'm sure some people listening will agree with this, which is silly, but then they start picking on like the sixth round picks. I had him reach out when Stepniak retired, and he, oh, bust, bust. <laughs> Dude, a sixth round pick? Do you want me to do, are you going to make me so mad that I'm going to do the homework to find out how many six round picks actually pan out? Because I'm about to do that. It's almost zero. It's why every year I say I don't care about six and seventh round picks because almost none of them pan out ever. And by the way, we have a starting guard out of that group of, of offensive linemen that we got. And what did I say? I would love it if we could get maybe one starter and one backup out of it. I would also be happy with just like two backups out of this group. That was my stand. I never expected three to even make it. Now, it might just be one starter and no backups because I don't know if Jake Hansen's going to have any real opportunities here. But getting a starter out of a group of three in the sixth round is fine with me. Perfectly fine with me. Because the sixth round is borderline waste of everybody's time. No offense to our sixth round picks, but I'm content with that. And we need to start having some better perspective. Anyways, what were we talking about? LaFleur's press conference. I guess if you want to critique the third round, you got a case, right? The Packers are horrific in the third round. Just the worst. I don't know why, but if we pick somebody in the third round, hopefully Amari skips that curse because he was technically a second round pick, right? The Packers wanted to take him in the second, but they they're like, all right, let's let's uh, let's go Josh, and then if he happens to slip into the second, we're gonna call up and just try desperately to get up and trade. So if it wasn't for Josh Myers, we would have taken him in the second, which means he's an automatic awesome play. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. If he's great, it's because he was a second-round guy. If he's terrible, then it's just the third-round curse all over again. But anyways, all that from A.J. Dillon. Um, but again, so so the prime primary three that we're going to see in preseason um, is going to be uh, the Kylan Hill, Patrick Taylor, and Dexter. And that's going to be a fantastic... Um, it's, it's going to be kind of sad, and I hope we bring on four running backs. I, I need to buckle down this next week and do a 53 because I'm I'm speaking. The, the benefit of doing a 53 is that you kind of get a better perspective, right? Otherwise, you just say things like, we should just have four running backs. Yeah, but then we have to cut somebody else, and the question is, who do we? what other position are we cutting off? And it gets to be hard because there might be a bunch of wide receivers that you like. And then you say, well, we got to carry three quarterbacks or what, whatever, right? I mean, we always want that extra guy, but you can't do that. You're going to have to, if you have one more here, you're going to have to have one less here. By the way, a lot of offensive linemen, possibly. I mean, granted, there's always the practice squad and, and you know, whatever. You, you got to sift through that, but that's the benefit of it. But um, this is this is a group I really like. I do like Kylan and what he brings. Patrick Taylor, obviously, he's, he's got the experience. Apparently, he's got intelligence beyond anything else. And again, I, I think at this point, I'm putting him number one, and it wouldn't have been that way. I think before that, he might have even been number three on my list, but just that comment from LaFleur might have put him at number one. But uh, we got to see. Moving on, Matt LaFleur says, Big Ten officials will be at family night tomorrow, not NFL officials. Quote, I think they'll do a good job of officiating what we're trying to accomplish. Packers will have NFL officials when they hold joint practices with the Jets. That is going to be a pretty wild uh, a wild situation. Um, not only is it going to be cool for us, I mean, you got you got to watch for injuries and fights and those kinds of things. I, and I don't I don't really care about fights as long as people don't get injured. Throw a couple. So what? Who cares? I, again, I don't like when a coach says I want you guys to fight because that's a little reckless. But when guys are getting a little chippy, so be it. Just you know, keep it within reason. 
I don't know how you strike a bat. I'm, you know, again, don't don't promote it, and the coaches need to be like, hey, 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 none of that nonsense. But uh, I don't, I don't, I don't hate it. But it's also going to bring a lot of national attention, right? We've got this new thing now where they're covering these training camps around the clock, and so there's a lot of different cameras out there and a lot of different stuff. When you got two teams going head to head, one of them is a young rookie quarterback like um, Zach Wilson. The other is Aaron freaking Rodgers. There's going to be a lot of attention to that particular joint practice. So we're going to be getting a lot of national coverage, I would assume, of that. A um, whole lot of attention, and it's going to be a, a fun week. Just hope we get out, like every other practice, just hope you get out uh, safe, including today at uh, at family family event thing. <laughs> I forgot what it's called now. Family night. LaFleur on what fans will see on family night. Quote, it'll probably be somewhat vanilla because this will be televised. There will be new wrinkles in all three phases, and we don't necessarily want to show that. So this is the Packers evolving, which is great. That's what has to happen. Now, it's not exactly what I was talking about in terms of evolving away from what you've been doing, the core of what this Shanahan offense is into something more new to attack modern day defenses. I think what's happening is you're continuing to see the book, you know, going on to a new chapter, right? This is still the same offense. We're just getting new pieces. Now we've got our H back playing a little bit more with DeGuara and, and a few other guys that can fill that role. Um, we've got Amari and we've got Randall. And so we can use different packages and things that he's already known about. We can just add them to the playbook. So I'm happy about it. Um, the only kind of long-term question about Matt LaFleur and any defensive coordinator that we have, offensive coordinator, whatever, is as the defenses continue to evolve, can we find a way to get around it? Because that's where Mike McCarthy fell apart, is defenses evolved to stop basically the Green Bay Packers offense and, and other teams that were running that style of offense. And while guys like Andy Reid figured out a way around it, while, while teams like the Saints adapted to get around it, the Packers did not. So, anyways. Matt LaFleur says he's, quote, thrown a lot at Amari Rodgers. We're not holding back. He's excited about what Rodgers can do with jet sweeps and such in his offense. So far, Rodgers handling everything well. He's been around the game for a long time. You can tell he's a coach's kid. So again, the intelligence factor, um, kind of like Stokes, but it sounds like he's doing a, a, it's kind of unfair to say he's doing a better job. Throwing a lot at Amari, you know, you got to remember when you're on offense, you know what's coming. Right, you call a play, and granted, you got to understand what the play is. But essentially, you're saying, "Hey, go run over there and catch a pass about five yards down the field." Stokes, it's, "Hey, stand here and react to whatever the other team does." Right? I'm not telling you what to do. <laughs> right? You not only have to know the play, but how to adapt and react to the guy in front of you. I just, I just think you know, maybe I'm just giving him too many excuses. I don't know, but I just think it's a real tough position. So picking on Amari and picking on Stokes are different things. It's, I mean, if you're going to tell him, "Hey, he's going to run a go," I like the one-on-ones. Maybe he's going to run a go route. Just just out loud, hey, Devontae, run a go route, see who wins. That would be similar to what you're telling Amari. And if he wins, he wins. He loses, he loses. Obviously, Amari and Stokes are also guys that I'm really looking forward to seeing. I, I don't expect to see a ton, but I'm hoping there is at least some 11 on 11 and we get to see something. What I can probably plan on is a lot of complaining tomorrow. Somebody's going to have a bad day. Jordan Love's going to throw a pick. Stokes is going to get picked on. Something and I'm going to have to hear a lot of complaining, and, and the word bust is going to be thrown around. Or somebody's going to get injured, and Matt LaFleur is going to be an idiot for doing 11-on-11. 11 11. Something. Something to complain about. I don't know. LaFleur on projected starting inside linebacker Devondre Campbell. Quote, he's been lights out. You can see the instincts that he has. He, he's very, very fluid, unquote. He says Campbell picking up on everything well since he arrived as a free agent. He knows Campbell well from spending time with him in Atlanta. Again, I've given you my opinion on Devondre Campbell. Obviously, they like him. I think they like him for the same reason that they liked Christian Kirksey, and it's because he's a veteran and he understands, you know, you don't need to really coach him up. And a lot of being an inside linebacker is being really intelligent and understanding and commanding the defense, and I think he'll probably be able to do that. The question is executing, and I don't expect much out of that. But again, it is what it is. You, you, uh, you think what you want to think, and I'll think what I want to think, and we'll see how it goes. Anyways, I think that's good enough. Why don't we take a break? Um, some thank yous to give out. Thank you very much to Mr. J.J. Leahy, Mike Hebring, and William Hauer for all donating to the Palmer Home. I really, really appreciate that. Puts us within about $300 of fifth place. I'm actually going to post that link right now. Uh, If you'd like to give to that, you can just reach out to me and I'll direct you in the right uh, spot. Otherwise, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. Haven't talked about it recently, but it is still a thing. If we get to 300 patrons by the start of the season, which I think I've lost patrons since we've started, so it's not looking great. But if we get to 300, by the conclusion of week one, I'm going to give away a Green Bay Packers ticket. 
take it to a game. There you go. Have a great time. Go enjoy the game. I might even throw in a Packernet shirt so you can go promote the podcast while you're there. We'll see how it goes. But we are um, 68 patrons away, which is a massive mountain to climb. But again, considering the amount of people listening, we could close that gap today if we wanted to. Buck a month. That's all it's going to take. A buck a month at patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy for a chance to enter and win a Packers ticket. And who knows? Maybe we cross that line and then I set up another goal for a uh, playoff ticket. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But we got to cross this one first. Then we cross the second one. And then maybe, maybe both of us go to the playoff game. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. See how bad you want it. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by HP. Whenever you do your best thinking, the HP Spectre X360 is ready when inspiration strikes. With power save for battery life and focus mode to multitask, you can do your best thinking whenever and wherever it happens. You can't always schedule when and where you might have a brilliant thought. Whether it's in the morning or before bed, when you're at your computer or away from it, thinking can happen anywhere and anytime. The HP Spectre X360 2-in-1 Convertible PC with Windows 10 saves battery life for whenever an idea hits you. HP Spectre X360, a more thoughtful laptop. The Fall Line is a true crime podcast covering the coldest cases in the southeastern United States and occasionally beyond. We focus on the missing persons, the unsolved murders, and the unidentified does that don't get media attention. Empathetic and intensively researched, The Fall Line will take you on deep dives into unsolved cases that you've never heard of and make you wonder why you haven't. Find us wherever you listen to podcasts. So I try to bounce back and forth between where I put my notes. I've got a pretty elaborate system now that I like, but sometimes I forget to switch back to my other note. Um, I accidentally, I just found a note from Matt LaFleur that I put in my Ravens note. But uh, LaFleur says tight end Jay Sternberger is bigger than he has been and had a good day in passing game yesterday. Said he seems to not lose his speed with adding the weight. So there you go. Anyways, I do want to rip through that because we got several days of training camp of other teams. So just kind of give you a rough uh, understanding of what's been going on. Again, um, partially good because we're going to be playing some of these teams, partially good to give us some perspective when we look at, okay, this is what's going on in our camp, what's going on in another camp. Some people are a little bit too hyped on guys and don't realize that everybody's hyping their guys. Some people are a little bit too down thinking that everybody else is just having great camps, and that's also not correct. So perspective time. 49ers. Obviously, it's mostly been all about Trey Lance. That's all anybody's talking about. It has been a little up and down. Uh, The first note here is basically uh, Nick, whatever, talking about the possibility that Trey Lance is going to be used like Taysom Hill. In other words, he's not going to be the full-time starting quarterback, but they're going to use him rotationally. Something interesting to keep an eye on. Next note says, Trey Lance hit deep throws to Ross Dwelly and George Kittle and then led second team offense to touchdowns on all four reps in red zone drills. He completed seven of eight on the day and the only incompletion coming on a deep throw to Kittle that might have been pass interfered. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, 6 of 11 in red, in red zone. The starting offense scored touchdowns on one of four plays. So Trey Lance, clearly ahead of Jimmy Garoppolo, at least insofar as, as these days here. Um, somebody else has a spreadsheet here. Uh, I'm going to pull that open real quick. But uh, in summary, Trey Lance has completed 91% of his passes, 20 of 22 over the past two days, and he's now flirting with an overall 70% completion rate against second team defense. Uh, The next day, practice is over for the first time 49ers actually ran scrimmage stuff, and that really changed the dynamic. Trey Lance finished with four straight incompletions. Garoppolo was three of three in that stretch, and the run game seemed effective. So that's interesting, right? We we got no pads, we, we got basic stuff, and Trey Lance is just killing it. Then they actually run scrimmage. Pads are on, chain gangs out there, 11 on 11. You got big boys rushing at you. You got a bunch of guys running routes at the same time. And Trey Lance has four straight incompletions in Garoppolo, three of three. So again, something to keep an eye on because up until recently, Trey Lance has been just this absolute freak. He's going to be great. We're all doomed. Mm, Let's hold off. Again, just kind of keeping things uh, alphabetical. Bears up next. Uh, This is going back to August 4th now. Uh, Reserve COVID list for the Bears. The Bears have been kind of decimated between injuries and COVID and all these different things, but... Linebacker Christian Jones, long snapper Pat Scales, and offensive lineman Elijah Wilkerson were moved to the uh, COVID list. 
Andy Dalton has looked like the most consistent quarterback Matt Nagy has ever coached in Chicago, but that's not to say he's headed for stardom. But he's brought stability to the franchise that desperately needs it at the position, if only to buy Fields more time to incubate. So this was, again, this was three days ago. The reports of Fields have been pretty glowing, but I've also noticed the Bears beat writers do a real good job of covering for Fields. In other words, you'll see Justin Fields with a great pass, Justin Fields with a great pass, Alec Ogletree with a great interception. Oh, excuse me, who threw that? <laughs> just just out of curiosity, who threw that pass? But anyways, it, it's been rather glowing of Justin Fields so far. Um, two injuries to monitor in Chicago that will change David Montgomery's outcomes in 2021. Number one, offensive tackle Tevin Jenkins. That's their second round pick that they traded up for. Um, back injury. He missed all of camp and expected to start at left tackle. Two, Tariq Cohen is weeks away from returning from an ACL. Not good. Leaving lots of targets available. Next day, August 5th, uh, Tease Tabor dropped an interception that hit him in the chest on a pass from Justin Fields. That That is my biggest, I've said it before, probably my biggest draft evaluation miss. Really liked Tease. Uh, both Andy Dalton and Justin Fields are having strong days at training camp today. Uh, another standout for me today is the linebacker Alec Ogletree, signed yesterday and already has an interception and has been good in coverage. Next day, well, Larry Borum is out today with a concussion for the Bears. I believe he's a fifth-round pick offensive lineman. Um, offensive line are dropping like flies. Austin Calantro picks off Justin Fields on his first throw of 11 on 11. So there you get who threw the pass, and it was his first throw of 11 on 11, and he throws a pick. Good play by the linebacker to tip it and pick it off. Finally, um, this is from yesterday. Highlights of the day, Roquan Smith just intercepted a shovel pass from Justin Fields in a live goal line drill. So that's three interceptions. I mean, technically it was a goal line thing. It was a shovel pass where he broke through, but still, that's that's three. Fields responds in the next play with a touchdown to rookie Khalil Herbert, who broke a tackle attempt from safety DeAndre Houston Carson. So even on that touchdown, I don't mean to be overly negative, but I'm trying to bring some clarity to a guy that's been hyped up as though he's the next uh, Russell Wilson, which that literal term has been used. Touchdown to running back Khalil Herbert, who broke several tackles, means he dumped the ball off at about the line of scrimmage and he ran for a touchdown. Bengals, I can basically summarize it by saying they're in complete disarray. Um, lots of concern about Joe Burrow. The coaches are basically saying, oh, no, I'm not worried. He's, you know, he just was injured and, you know, it's going to take him some time to come back. No, it's bad. Here's a quote on Joe Burrow. Quote, it's just not good right now. Throws that felt like layups last year are dropping harmlessly away from receivers or easily broken up by multiple d- defenders. There might be a multitude of reasons for struggles, but this has been ugly. Not only that, the wide receivers have been terrible. And again, I want to sit here for a while. For all the people who are mad about the Packers not getting wide receivers, why didn't you get wide receivers? Why? And one of the names that keeps coming up is T. Higgins. They not only have T. Higgins, they have Jamar Chase. I have not seen a single good note about Jamar Chase, not one yet. All I've seen is Joe Burrow has been terrible, and these wide receivers cannot get open to save their lives. By the way, the Bengals, not great corners. T. Higgins and Jamar Chase are on this team. Here's a quote. It's tough uh, to single out any one of the receivers when everyone is falling, failing to get separation and not making plays. Chase had a drop on the first play of 11-on-11. Boyd got a a pass for him broken up on back-to-back plays in 7-on-7. Nobody made any splash plays. Boyd is another one. So they already had Boyd, who was a good receiver a couple years ago. Then they drafted Higgins, who a lot of Packer fans wish that we had gotten instead of love. He's not been very good. And then this year, they go and get Jamar Chase. Rather than getting that offensive lineman to give their quarterback peace of mind, no, we're going to get a third wide receiver. And now they don't have an offensive line. Their quarterback is in panic mode. He can't throw to anybody. And none of these three really good wide receivers are able to get open against garbage corners. Things are really, really bad. And this is a team that doesn't have a good defense. The offense is supposed to be fine. You got Joe Mixon. You got three dominant wide receivers. You got this stud quarterback. It should be fine. Granted, we didn't do anything to help our offensive line. I mean, we did some stuff, but we didn't get Panay Sewell, which we should have. But whatever. I'll leave that alone. It's a nightmare over there. The Bengals are terrible. Um, if this continues, they're in contention for the number one overall pick. I gave that to the Lions, or the Texans or the Lions were kind of in that competition. We have to strongly consider the Bengals at this point if that doesn't get cleared up. Notes from uh, the Buffalo Bills, obviously the biggest one being Josh Allen, got a six-year contract extension through 2027, uh, $258 million, including $150 million guaranteed. I believe that's the highest ever. Um, so his Guaranteed at signing was $100 million, which is the highest ever, and then guaranteed, including injury, um, is $150 million, which I believe is also the highest above Pat Mahomes, which gives you some perspective on Pat Mahomes' contract. I know it's hard to get out of because they got this weird 
way that it's structured. But in terms of actual guarantees, there's not much. It's a $500 million contract, and there's not even $150 million in guarantees in that contract. But a couple quick notes here uh, for Bill's practice. Jay Kumaro, superstar-like practice, starting 1v1s with wins versus Trey White, carried uh, over to team. Josh Allen is surgical, missed few throws, but was real good. Tremaine Edmonds pick. Diggs, Beasley, midseason form, didn't see Emmanuel Sanders. So the Bills seem very much like the Packers, right? The the star players are already ready to go. Josh Allen could be in the in the postseason today, right? Just like Aaron Rodgers. Stephon Diggs just I mean, he doesn't even need to be out there. He's ready to go, midseason form. Um, and then you got some other guys popping up. You're not seeing drama, you're not seeing nonsense, you're not seeing crazy fights. This is just a well put together playoff caliber team. Same thing you're seeing from the Chiefs. I give have very little notes from the Chiefs because it's just basically nothing but Pat Mahomes is just shredding everybody. The Bucks, same thing, right? The Bucks are ready to go. They're just dominating. They're everything looks great. Tom Brady is looking, I mean, he's just throwing incredible throws. Right. So these top teams are just, they're ready to go, right? We don't even need preseason. This is a waste of everybody's time. Let's just get this going. Uh, Broncos, again, a lot of bluster, a lot of, we're great. Everybody's elite, all this stuff. Um, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I think it's interesting. Um, they do have a lot of talent. It's just a matter of, can they turn the corner? Because they haven't done anything yet. Noah Fant, again, there's talent there, but is he really going to break out? Like officially really break out? Jerry Judy, right? He wasn't very good. I know Bron- Broncos fans get mad, but there's the same group that got mad when I said Drew Locke isn't good. I don't really value their opinion that much at this point. Anyways, uh, Melvin Gordon, Javante Williams, Mike Boone. The Broncos appear to be using a three-back approach. Each running back has impressed in the first week of camp. K.J. Hamler back at Broncos practice. Not practicing. Tyree Cleveland, Josie Jewell, Mac McCain, Von Miller, Cody Conway, Graham Glasgow, Deion Sizer, and Mike Purcell. There's a couple big names in there. Purcell, Glasgow, Von Miller, Josie Jewell. Big names. Drew Locke on Jerry Judy. He is something different. He is making big boy strides. That's going to be important for them, obviously. Uh, slight win for Teddy today. Both quarterbacks had an interception. Teddy in end zone to Simmons. Drew's tipped by a gim packed, uh, picked by Watson. Locke extra conservative today. Bridgewater connected on multiple passes over 20, including 50-yard touchdown to Judy. Could have been a sack. Teddy had bigger plays. I'll be honest. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that nobody's even mentioning Teddy Bridgewater because everyone just assumes Drew's going to get the job. I would actually be a little surprised considering how bad Drew Locke is if Teddy didn't win. And I know they might be trying to push Drew into that position because Teddy is not going to be the long-term answer. So let's at least see what we got in Drew. But um, I think Teddy's a better quarterback. So finally, Pat Shermer on Javante Williams, and they've been effusive in their praise of Javante Williams this whole time. Quote, he's been terrific. His running ability is very obvious, but the thing that we're seeing is his instincts as a football player. He gets it and he shows up in the pass protection. It shows up being able to uh, get lines up his aware. I don't know, whatever. It doesn't. He's good, right? So fantasy football update, but still kind of iffy because, again, they're using a three-back approach. So I don't know. You figure out what you want to do. Browns camp, basically the hype is around Donovan Peoples-Jones, one of the funniest names ever. Again, it just sounds, hello there, voice gone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just sounds like you, got a, you have to have a speech impediment to say his name, Donovan Peoples-Jones. Um, I don't think, I don't have any notes here, but I don't think it's been great for the Browns so far, as, especially with Baker Mayfield. It's been kind of up and down, but... Anyways, uh, as far as this past week, Donovan Peoples-Jones has been the biggest, biggest uh, hype thing. Bucks again, nothing super great. It's just, uh, you know, Darden. People love Darden. Tom Brady looks great. Evans is looking great. Uh, you know, just again, everybody looks great. Uh, Cardinals. It's all about Rondale Moore. I think I talked about that last time. They're very excited about Rondale Moore. AJ Green um, has not been at camp for several days. Christian Kirk is just getting back to camp. So this is a team that needs five wide receivers. They are constantly getting wide receivers. They draft wide receivers, and then they draft more, and then they go in free agency and get um, the biggest wide receiver in football, and then they go in free agency and get A.J. Green, and then they draft Rondale Moore. They've done nothing but draft wide receivers because they like to spread the ball out a lot, and they're struggling to get as much talent at wide receiver as as they need. Um, But they're taking another swing at Rondale Moore, and it seems like so far it's working out for them. Again, Chiefs, nothing really. Uh, bit of an injury bug at first. Tyreek Hill, Juan Thornhill, DeAndre Baker, Nick Kaiser, Evan Bayless, Chad Williams, Kyle Long, Malik Herring, Mike Remmers, all not in practice. That was as of the fourth. Tyreek Hill is back in pads. Some of these guys are starting to come back. Otherwise, it's just it's all just uh, Pat Mahomes highlights. Colts, after losing their star players, are just falling apart. That's all you need to know there. Uh, Dolphins, it sounds like Tua's kind of having a good run at this. 
Uh, Tua was six touchdowns and no picks the last couple of practices with red zone drills. Waddle Wilson with two touchdown catches for him today, all in 11 all on 11 work. No interceptions from Tua since uh, two on opening day last Wednesday. So he started off with this sort of, oh, no, we're in trouble. Since then, he's been pretty surgical. But uh, Will Fuller is injured right now. Xavier Howard is injured and looking for a trade. So things in some ways are looking good for the Dolphins, in some ways are looking kind of bleak. Eagles, another team that are just kind of a mess. Um, they're trying to cover for Hurts and really highlight his, his positives as much as possible, but there's just so much inconsistency. Hurts with an ugly interception, threw it right to linebacker Jacoby Stevens over the middle of the field, who, was an e- who easily picked it off. Uh, Nick Sirianni just unloaded on Jalen Rager following a second-round rep, uh, like legit tore into him. Nick Sirianni had naming Jalen Hurts the week one starter. Quote, there's no rush, we're just not there yet. Well, they've got Joe Flacco and Nick Mullins behind him, so... It's not super great to have Jalen Hurts taking all the number one reps, and he was a starter last year, and we can't just say he's our guy. And then finally, Miles Sanders fumbled the ball in 11-11 drill, ball security, and drops an issue for Sanders in camp. So again, it's just, things are just not good for the Eagles. It's been that way for a while. Um, Javian Hawkins making plays for the Falcons, two long runs. Not a lot else going on with the Falcons right now. Um, For the Giants, Kenny Galladay hurt his hamstring. Not considered a significant injury, but still not great. And you know how much those can linger. So he might seem to be a week away, and that week away will last for like seven weeks. So you never know. Uh, Dante Pettis not doing well. He's fallen behind in the tight battle for the final receiver spot. Uh, Giants are expecting Saquon Barkley back week three. So he's going to be out for the first two weeks, but then he's coming back. Again, fantasy implications as well as just general team implications. Um, and then Daniel Jones, who's had a great camp. And I again, I think he's fairly solid. Uh, had a pretty rough day yesterday. It says, rough turnover-filled day for Daniel Jones, as well as a few other updates, but it was attached to an article, so I won't bother reading them. Jaguars, again, I still haven't heard a ton from their quarterback. Nothing bad. It's just, you would think that it would be not, I mean, like the Bears, you get excited and you just talk about your quarterback all the time, all the time. Every throw is the greatest throw you've ever seen. They're just not doing that. It's so weird to me. Uh, James Robinson stacked good days. Got a ton of separation against Miles Jack in 1v1. Travis Etienne continues to impress with his speed. He's going to be a matchup nightmare this year. Jaguars are signing wide receiver kick returner Tamon Austin, source says. Was with the Packers last year. And then finally, the run game is clearly going to be a big part of the Jaguars' offense, and it isn't surprising to see both Robinson and Hyde still getting their fair share of touches with the starting offense. So again, nothing about the quarterback. Not one note over like three days of notes about their starting quarterback all we've seen are running back notes and the fact that they're going to run the ball a ton. It's just, it's strange to me. It could be a sign he's not really doing well, but there, I haven't seen that either. You would think that somebody would be pointing that out. Um, as far as the Jets, I mean, it's, uh, we got Michael Carter and Tevin Coleman, your top two running backs. Rough red zone series for Zach Wilson. This was August 4th. Given a first down following a run with two incompletions. Had Crowder open for a touchdown, but sailed it too high. Um, Elijah Moore continues to be the guy that stands out for the Jets. Uh, note here says, I think it's crazy. They, the thing about Elijah Moore, every day I come in your saying I'm going to focus on someone else, then he makes it impossible. Uh, August 4th, this must have been the next day, I don't know. Good day for Zach Wilson after two okay practices. He was sharp and accurate during uh, team, was pretty good during 7-on-7 seven seven in the red zone too, but I take those periods with a grain of salt. Standout performers on August 5th, Corey Davis was a constant security blanket for Zach Wilson. Jared Davis caught an interception and was flying around, and the run game stood out. So Zach Wilson starting to kind of turn a corner a little bit, but still pretty bleak for the Jets, which is to be expected. The the Jets drafting a good quarterback is going to force the universe to implode on itself, I think. Uh, Lions, it's been very little uh, as far as positive. DeAndre Swift going to be a bell cow. Having Jamal Williams around has really helped a second, uh, former second rounder take another step. Next day, Amon Ra just jumped over Jeff Okuda during an open field tackling drill, then punted the ball. I'm entertained. So again, that sort of that sort of energy, it's, it's what they want, I guess. You know, a lot of bravado, a lot of just unnecessary like leaping and jumping and hitting and you know punting a ball, which I guess that's entertaining. It's also called a penalty during an NFL game, so maybe don't do that. I mean, if I'm the coach, I'm looking at him like, dude, don't punt my balls around. I mean, that's, you, I, I don't know, <laughs> whatever. I'm sure their head coach thought it was great, though. Brashad Perriman shaken up after trying to catch a Jared Goff pass, walked off the field with, under his own power after a couple minutes, still being evaluated by trainers. Next day, St. Brown had an up-and-down day, looked really good, 
early, including the aforementioned hurdle of Okuda, dropped a pass later, and I think it was Aroarie who batted down a pass a few reps later. And then finally, Goff started off practice dropping dimes as the team practiced deep balls in 1v1. However, when we got to team drills, it was a little more of the same. He took one deep shot, which was overthrown, a lot of checkdowns, last throw of pass, he hesitated, threw it, and it should have been pick six. So Jared Goff, as I expected, looks terrible. Again, I think Jared Goff is not a very good quarterback. I think we saw what Jared Goff was when he was first drafted, and he was horrific. It was terrible. Sean McVay and Matt LaFleur showed up. You know, you've got a new quarterback-friendly scheme and a very good quarterback coach coaching him up with some with a great offensive line, great wide receivers, and a real good scheme, and he kind of stood out. He was a good quarterback. As that started to go away, Jared Goff was terrible again. The offensive line eroded, the wide receivers eroded, defenses are catching up to the McVay system, all that stuff. He eroded. So I think you're taking a underrated quarterback in Matt Stafford and sending him over to the Rams, and you're taking an overrated quarterback and sending him down to the Lions. And I think, again, you're going to see Stafford and the Rams improve, and I think you're going to have Goff and the Lions really just implode. I mean, it's going to be kind of like what you saw with Goff year one would be my expectation. Not because he's a rookie, just because he had a different coach and it was a horrible team and it was horribly coached. And that's just my assumption. But again, I don't think this is the long-term. Now, I don't know about the coach. I like what the front office is doing in terms of building the team. I don't know if this is the coach that we want. I have no idea. But at the end of the day, the goal needs to be maybe next year when we get the first, second, or third pick to get a quarterback and really, really try to try again. Uh, Patriots are a mess at the quarterback position. Um, Nikhil Harry is really starting to stand out, but it's so up and down. You know, one day Cam Newton looks great. The next day Cam Newton looks terrible. Rough seven on seven series for Cam Newton. His first pass was intercepted by JC Jackson. His second was broken up by Jackson. A few plays later, he overthrew Nelson Aguilar deep, which is his calling card, overthrowing people. Um, seven on seven notes, Newton, two of six, an interception, another pass breakup, and a drop. Jones was four of five with an overthrow on his last pass negated by a defensive penalty. Most completions were checkdowns, though Jones hit Nikhil Harry twice downfield versus Juwan Williams, had a two-minute feel to it with tempo. Nikhil Harry was a player of the day. Um, next note on Cam Newton, struggled with accuracy today, was seven of 13 with a drop and two interceptions. He's now got five interceptions in camp, so Cam is looking terrible as expected, because he's just not that good. I'm sorry. Again, I I think it's because of fantasy football that people thought he was good. He was never really that good. He had one good year when they had that Super Bowl run where he did a really good job. Otherwise, he's been, at best, decent. Mac Jones was sharp uh, throughout and was 7 of 23, three drops, one incompletion, and Henry tripped with an interception on a drop ball. He's got two interceptions in camp. Josh McDaniels on Mac Jones, quote, he's good at getting yelled at because Josh Josh McDaniels is a dummy. Another prolonged look at Mac Jones in 11-on-11s. 11 11s. He just took 14 consecutive reps before handing it back to Cam Newton. They're very clearly pushing Mac Jones to be the starter at this point. They're like, all right, Cam doesn't have it. We might as well run with Mac and see what it is. It's not like it's not like Cam is going to win us anything. But it's not like, you know, we would like to see what the rookie can do. But, you know, Cam is like the man. Sort of like Andy Dalton. Like, he, he's not great, but he's he's clearly better than our rookie. So let's just let Dalton go out and do what he's going to do, and then eventually we'll... At this point, it's like, dude, Mac might even be better, so why don't we just run with the rookie? Anyways, it's it's more of, of the same of that. Um, the, the final day here, this was August 5th recap. Um, Newton was 2 of 6. Jones was 10 of 14. That was in 11 on 11s. In 7 on 7s, uh, Newton was 2 of 4. Jones was 2 of 3. Second day, we saw increased reps for Jones. Most were against the backups, but Jones was clearly the better quarterback today, certainly an improvement from Tuesday's padded practice. Raiders, it's all about um, Brian Edward. Now, it's silly the amount of hype he's getting, but it is worth noting how much hype he's getting from everybody. I mean, they, they said he's like a, <laughs> I forgot what it was, it's was, it was something stupid, like a, a cross between, oh, here it is, Terrell Owens and Randy Moss. John Gruden said on NFL Network, Brian Edwards has been looking like Terrell Owens, but he's looking more like Randy Moss. You're being stupid. At that point, I'm tuning you out. Uh, Rams note, Aaron Donald says Matt Stafford is playing lights out, just watching him the way he works, the ball he's throwing to wide receivers. I've never seen anything like, uh, never seen it done like that. So to see it firsthand, it's pretty cool. So again, he's maybe just talking, but at the same time, I do think that it's probably very true that this is the best quarterback he's seen play in a Rams uniform. That should be fairly straightforward to most people that that would have been the case. Uh, Rams note, Lamar Jackson is back. So that's kind of the one thing that's interesting. Um, Mark Andrews is the best receiver on the field. This was uh, yesterday. Also not surprising. They love their tight ends. They utilize their tight ends. And it's been pretty common that the tight ends have been their best receivers. 
Um, as far as the Saints, it's just hilarious watching Jameis Winston. He's basically, uh, I feel like it's like watching the Harlem Globetrotters, but this is that other team. You know, what was the name of that? I forget the name of that team, but it's like the other team. Jameis is just a big goofball. It's almost like he's embraced the fact that he's just a big goofball at this point. And I'll, I'll be honest, I'm kind of enjoying it. I, I used to not really like him because he's an arrogant guy who's done some stuff that isn't great. But at this point, it's kind of like, yeah, I'm a clown and I'm, it's fine. I like it. It's like, all right, that's fine. If you're, if you're going to embrace it, I'll, uh, I'll roll with that. That's fine. But uh, Jameis Winston, this is August 4th, worked as QB1 today. He had his first interception on a pass to Kawan Baker. Ball hung and Crawley picked it off. Jameis Winston, this is August 5th, just tried to throw a pass to the middle while rolling out his momentum going in the opposite direction. Zach Bond almost had a pick six, but he couldn't complete the interception. So it's it's not great. Jameis is maybe QB1, but he's not a very good one. Texans, basically um, every single day we get an update that Deshaun Watson is not at practice. As I said, he's not going to be at practice. The only reason he's even there is because he doesn't want to get fined. It's the only reason he showed up. He's going to get massively fined if he doesn't show up. So he shows up and all of a sudden, oh, my foot. Okay. And to be honest, I don't, I wouldn't doubt it if the team is completely fine with that. Because I don't think they really like the situation either of having Deshaun, who is accused of these horrible things, in their uniform on the field playing and, and being around them. So their way around this is to be like, so your foot hurts, right? And he's like, yeah, pretty bad. And they're like, ooh, that looks bad. Why don't you just maybe go back to the, the room that you're in and play games or something? I don't know. Titans, really, the only note from the Titans so far has been that Julio Jones has not been at practice, and I still don't exactly know why. Um, it's been like three, four days now. I don't know what the deal is there. Uh, Washington, same note as last time. Basically, Fitzpatrick is stepping up as a pretty solid quarterback like he always does, and he's developing some synergy with McLaurin, which, again, makes sense because he's a good wide receiver. So should be a pretty good matchup, to be honest. I mean, just from a fantasy perspective, I don't really like Washington, but Fitzpatrick and McLaurin, it makes sense to me. Finally, the Minnesota Vikings offense looks completely out of sync. Cook and Browning both fumbled. Offensive line got scolded for not finishing blocks in 11 and 11 moments ago. This is from August 5th. Danny Etling, who now appears to be number two quarterback, just overthrew a receiver on an out route on a play where he would have been sacked. So they started to devolve, at least the offense started to devolve into chaos mode. Now all their quarterbacks went away, so their defense is clearly better than the offense, and the offense just was terrible. But you even got guys like Dalvin Cook, right? So you say, okay, well, you know, our starting quarterback wasn't there, so that happens. Okay, but Dalvin Cook is even not, so it's just, there's just sort of an energy. And at the end of the day, there's something to this. We, we've seen it where good teams just don't show up. The Packers do that. And there's just something in the air. It's the locker room. It's the negative press. It's all these guys are getting injured. Things just aren't going well. And you're just, your head's not quite in it. And this is what happens. Uh, next note, Dalvin Cook took a direct snap from center. Second time we've seen the Wildcat in practice since the quarterbacks got put on injured reserve, which is just kind of funny because if it wasn't for the quarterback situation, you might look at it and go, ooh, maybe they're going to try that. And maybe they will. But it's also like, look, just get the quarterback off the field and let Dalvin direct snap. <laughs> I don't even want to see these guys. K.J. Osborne has been one of the most impressive players at Vikings camp. He's making a strong push for the wide receiver three job, which is always a hilarious job for the Vikings because you got two dominant guys and one guy nobody cares about. That's not great. Finally, Justin Jefferson had somewhat of a scare. He went down on his shoulder, immediately grabbed that area, so you start worrying about a uh, broken collarbone. It sounds like that's not going to be the case. Um, according to this, tests came out as good as possible for Justin Jefferson, who is now considered day-to-day all positive news. I did have somebody to reach out and say something about four or like three or four weeks. He might be out. I don't know if that's, if you saw that somewhere or what, but I have not personally seen that. But anyways, that's all the notes I got for you. Again, we're going to get to the questions and all that. Um, There's just been a lot of things to cover. And again, I've been taking notes on these teams for three days. I had to dump it at some point. And this felt like the appropriate time because obviously tomorrow we can't do it. We got to talk about family night. Anyways, I'm also, this is what I'm going to do right now. Um, if you're not in the Packernet Podcast Facebook group, please get in the Packernet Podcast Facebook group. I'm going to create a thread in there, and it's going to be simply observations from Packers Family Night. And so you can feel free to jump in there and um, just drop in your observations, and then tomorrow I might go in there because it's hard to notice everything. The cameras just fly all around and all these different things. So it'll be interesting to see what other people think about uh, what they saw. All right, it's posted. You folks have yourselves a fantastic Saturday. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.